grace be multiplied to all of you people and peace from Jesus Christ and from God the Father who raised him from the dead. We're going to hear most of the epit or, uh, gospel lesson rather from John 15, this time in another translation. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you command, whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. Now let's pray. Lord, set our feet on solid ground and let your words go with us in all our ways. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, may your name, O Lord, be praised. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. In the holy name of Jesus, my dear and treasured brothers and sisters, one and all of you. When it comes to the apostles Simon and Jude, I'm afraid I cannot say very much. There are reports, of course, claiming to tell their stories, but the fact is that we haven't got a lot in the New Testament. This festival recalls Simon the Zealot, not that other much better known Simon, the one we usually call Peter the Rock Man. And it remembers Jude, whom you must not confuse with Judas Iscariot. You'll notice that even the appointed readings on this festival day of St. Simon and St. Jude don't give you any concrete anecdotes about these two because we simply do not have that much available. These apostles are obscure. It's easy not to notice them. In that way, they may be the way you feel yourself to be sometimes. Maybe not a big name in a big church, serving perhaps in some out of the way place. We have so many of those in Canada and not expecting exactly to go down in history as they say. If that's how you feel, please understand that you are like Simon and Jude in another very deep way. You are one at whom Jesus aims the words in this gospel lesson just read. Because Simon and Jude were surely there, our two obscure apostles, to hear them when Jesus first spoke them, as you are present to hear them this night. By these words, the Lord would like to kindle in you what he was aching to kindle in his first disciples, and that's a love to look both ways. You can't help but feel like you're standing at the edge of an ocean Whenever you hear this part of John's Gospel, Jesus' deep word pointing his men to the future after he would be back in heaven. One great focus for that time, and the fact is it's the time in which we're still living, is to aim love at your needy brothers and sisters at this moment. My command is this, the Lord said, love each other as I have loved you. So this love must first reach you before you would ever be in a position to give it to somebody else. It's not just a kind sentiment or a sugary wish, but this is the love that the Lord looked down and saw you simply had to have, and he worked hard then to bring it to you. This is the love that moved Jesus to take all the glories that he had as the pre-incarnate Son of God, his closeness to the Father, his being surrounded by the songs of the angels, and to trade them all in for the straw of Bethlehem's manger. 
This is the love that drove him to put himself in a home under parents who were much less than he was and to be subject to them. It's the love that compelled him to preach and teach and heal even among people who ended up pushing him away. It's the love that made him endure a trial where people said lying, hateful things. The love that accepted torture and being spiked tight to a piece of wood. It's the love that poured the blood out of his veins and drained all the life away from his holy body. It's the love that hung on as bystanders made fun of his pain and the Father didn't answer when Jesus called out to the sky. This love bought the pardon which the Lord now offers you in sheer and undeserved mercy. You would literally, in every conceivable way, die forever without it. My command is this, he said, when he was getting ready to leave. Love each other as I have loved you. It's interesting he did not, in parting, publish a kind of a practical ten-point program or list specific achievements that you and I should come up with, the kind of thing that would really impress other people, nor did he command specific signs and miracles. He calls on you instead to embrace the saving love that he gives you and to embrace it so deeply that it simply can't help itself, but it breathes out into the lives of brothers and sisters in God's family. To say it again, the love they need from you is never just a kind sentiment or a sugary wish. This love thinks really hard about what will do another person good. Greater love has no one than this, the Lord said, than that he lay down his life for his friends. In other words, this love is willing to endure ever so much to bring about that good for your neighbor. This love to look at the need of brothers and sisters grows and is nourished out of the truth that Christ gives you. He's not a master who makes you into a common slave and keeps you in the dark about everything. To be sure, there were times when Jesus did call his disciples his servants, and there were times when the Apostle Paul, for example, called himself and his co-workers servants of Christ. But it's not one of those servant arrangements where you serve just because you are forced or where the master steps on you and exploits you. I no longer call you servants like that, Jesus made clear, because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends, for everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. What an unbelievable, beautiful servant life this is. Your master lifts you up. Your master sets you by his side. Your master calls you friend. Your master tells you deeply and richly how much he cares about you. Tells you deeply and richly where he's taking you and where it's all going to lead. Tells you deeply and richly what his mission for you in this world is. It's interesting, although Jesus, by this love, honors you and sets you by himself as a friend, in his very gentle way, he never lets you forget who's doing the giving and the leading. He's doing it, not you. You didn't choose me, he said, but I chose you and I appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, even fruit that would last. The love that he gives you and the love that he commands you to give to your brothers and sisters is to bear fruit. And I'm not talking about the kind of fruit that you decide on the kind of thing that can really sparkle today because you decided on it, and then can wither tomorrow because you decided on it. I mean the fruit that he seeks. My grandpa Stratton, for example, did not plant an apple tree in the backyard behind his house years and decades ago so that the tree would stand there and kind of scratch its head and think to itself, what do I feel like bearing? You know, and then maybe produce red onions or dill pickles for him or something like that. He planted the tree to give what he was looking for, apples. You didn't plant yourself. Your Lord chose you and appointed you to bear the fruit that he's looking for. It's hard to know sometimes exactly what that might be in concrete terms. 
and it's hard to know exactly what to do sometimes to make it happen. Know this, it will never happen by your planning and your strategizing alone. For this fruit bearing you have to lean really hard on God and beg Him to lead you to this harvest. I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, even fruit that would last, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He might give you. So note the context here, brothers and sisters. Jesus does not give you this prayer promise to use as a blank check to meet your ministry goals or to bless your lottery ticket or to guarantee any number of other wishes that you've decided upon. It's when you take his love seriously and realize that he has appointed you to, to bear the fruit that he seeks. When you understand that you could never make that happen and that you have to run desperately to him to guide and to bless you, that's when he pledges that his Father God will answer and give you what you beg of him. These things I have commanded you, that you love each other, he repeats. You and I, beloved pastors and deacons, are linked together as the chosen friends of Jesus who have been told his will, who are working to bear his chosen fruit, having the promise that the Father answers our prayers for the work we share. How can we do anything else than be devoted to each other? The holy writer of Hebrews 10 was right on target, wasn't he? Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's a mindset for you as we go into our little conference week starting in the morning. Because you and I need each other badly. I know at least I need you very badly, especially now as the winds of our time blow rather cold at God's people and we're getting closer to the end of all things. I remember the day, it's probably about 1959, when my mother taught me how to cross the street in front of our house. Before you start out, she said, look both ways. Jesus seeks to plant in you a love that looks both ways. With all proper respect to loving brothers and sisters, the Lord has never called you to be hermits, just fleeing into a ghetto somewhere and only building up yourselves. We are pastors and deacons. You think about what those terms mean. You're called to shepherd and to serve others. You're called to a love that looks both ways. Yes, toward your needy brothers and sisters at this moment, but also to a love that looks to the world around you. Loving somebody does not mean that you refuse to face up to his defects. Jesus certainly here teaches Simon and Jude and you and me to face the truth about the world around us. If the world hates you, he said, know that it has hated me first before you. If you would be of the world, the world would have loved you as its own because you are not of the world. This is why the world hates you. The hatred is such a harsh sounding term to our modern day ears that we might be tempted to kind of squelch this or at least slide over it rather quickly. But this is what Jesus told his men to expect from the faithless world. It's the honest thing. You are all born into the world. You eat the food it produces and you breathe its air. But as the believing sons and daughters of God, you draw your life from somewhere else. You draw it from Christ. If you'd stay totally rooted in the world and live for its goals alone and adopt its mind and think its thoughts, the world would accept you just fine. But a long time ago already, it pushed away the one who came to save it. He was despised and rejected of men, Isaiah foretold about Jesus Christ. And 700 years later, that's exactly the way it played out. He was rejected and prosecuted. He was tortured crucified, he was reviled and ridiculed. And now, this Jesus has called you into his marvelous light. By drawing you out of the world and close to himself, Jesus has also drawn you into the same tension with the world that he himself endured. It's a heavy burden and he cannot lift it off your shoulders. It's already hard enough 
a few people hate you, without your heart starting to tremble a little bit and get resentful and bitter. But it's harder still to stay steady and focused when it's not just the odd person here or there, but the great prevailing mind and heart of society that rebels at this Christ and sometimes pushes away the servants who proclaim him. And Peter wrote about that too, didn't he? Dear friends, he said, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you're suffering as if something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So this hatred actually assures you that you are very close to Jesus on a good and healthy path. I said a minute ago, loving someone does not mean that you refuse to face up to his defects. The world and its desires are passing away, the Bible says. They're decaying. I can't think of a polite way to say that. This does not mean, however, that you now have a good excuse for holding the people of the world in contempt. Jesus himself cared deeply, even about the people who ended up pushing him away. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he lamented. You who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. He meant that, just as he meant every syllable of maybe the most famous thing he ever said. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The apostles, and Simon and Jude were there among them. They soaked up this rare love of Jesus. They faced the world's hatred head on, and yet they sought to embrace people with the saving good news. We can't help ourselves in all of this, said a man like Paul. Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all. Well, dear ones, we're convinced of it too, aren't we? And now God has put it into our hearts to invest the working energies of our lives to bring Christ to people. I don't think I have to talk much to impress upon you how true to life Jesus' words about the world's resistance are. They're being fulfilled every day of the week, right here in our land. And I don't think I have to use up a lot of words either to persuade you how deeply we need the love of each other to carry us in our weaknesses, and yes, to help us stay properly humble when things go well. So this obscure pair of apostles, Simon and Jude, may be teaching you something by the fact that they seem to have fallen between the cracks, you might say. They remind you that your task is not to erect monuments to yourself, and it's not just to fulfill the goals that you're tempted to set, but your task is to lose yourself in Jesus, your Lord and the Savior of the world, just as Simon and Jude and many others who seem to have gotten themselves lost in Christ now sing with saints and angels the song that has no end. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.